Hello, and welcome to the Imposter Syndrome Network podcast, where everyone belongs, especially if you think you don't. My name is Chris Grundeman, and I'm here with my incredible co-host, Zoe Rose. Hello. This is the Jeremy Rossback episode, and I think you're going to love it. Jeremy is a highly passionate evangelist and marketer with practical experience in disruptive technologies. Hey, Jeremy, would you like to introduce yourself a bit further to the Imposter Syndrome Network? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Zoe. I'm really happy to be here today. Sure. My name is Jeremy Rossback, and I've been in the IT industry for a little over 25 years now. First half of my career, I was on the consumer side of IT, so I was running data centers and networks for the likes of uh, Northrop Grumman, Department of Veterans Affairs here on the East Coast in the U.S., T. Rowe Price, and some startups. So definitely was immersed in the mid-90s, early 2000s of running data centers and all that it took to keep those businesses going. And then around uh, 2007, I joined uh, Computer Associates, and they turned into CA Technologies, running data centers for them, moved into pre-sales after that, and then finally moved into marketing about 10 years ago, which is actually where I uh, started from when I graduated from college with a marketing degree. So it kind of came full, full circle and all that. Awesome. Lots of ground to cover there. We will definitely dive into your career in a little bit. But first, I'm curious because I know that you and Broadcom both participate in ONUG, what was the open networking user group and has seemed to evolve beyond that. And really out of some personal curiosity, I'd love to know more about the value you get from that org and their events and, and how you participate and, and what they're up to these days. Yeah, yeah, great question. And ONUG is, is definitely a different convention. What I love about what ONUG does is they have the ONUG board, which is made up of the ITs of consumer, or excuse me, the consumers of IT, at many of the major companies out there that we work with at Broadcom. So C-level executives, head of IT, head of networks are part of the ONUG board, and they present their challenges to vendors like Broadcom throughout the year. And it is our responsibility as a vendor to come to the ONUG spring and fall shows and basically proof of concept what we believe our software can do to help these large companies overcome their challenges. It's very exciting. You always are speaking to the right title and role and persona when you're at these events, unlike you know some other large events where a lot of folks may not even be interested in the software you're selling and just really more there for the tchotchkes. But yeah, it's a very unique event. You get a wonderful attendance. You get the right persona to speak to, and you know exactly what use cases they're interested in that you could uh, help them uh, achieve. Sounds like that involves quite a bit of creativity because if you've got a lot of different use cases and you're trying to figure out how you can apply to that, my question is: IT isn't necessarily known for being creative people. How do you deal with that and kind of build your creativity and feel confident in it? when it's maybe not a career known for that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and I feel really strongly about creativity and, and passion in, in IT. Listen, I, I'm sure you guys will agree. Data centers are data centers, servers are servers, networks are networks. You know, they're, they're, we're still racking and stacking equipment inside of these buildings and still sending packets like we were in the 90s. So, you know, you got to come up with, a new way to help your customers see you in a different light, right? I mean, there's so many vendors out there like Broadcom, it's saturated with monitoring solutions and AI ops solutions and you name it, security solutions. And, you know, something that we did at ONUG is to, to host these very small 15-minute small bites sessions, uh, no pun intended when it comes to networking where they were very quick how-to sessions for the participants that showed up at the events. One example would be how to monitor work from home user experiences for Microsoft Teams. You know, the pandemic has has turned network monitoring and networking on its head, right? Uh, with a large majority of user experiences starting from home instead of starting from inside of corporate headquarters. So the ability to engage your audience with something a little more creative, like like a how-to session to get very personal, 
get rid of all the buzzwords around, you know, software selling and just really let the consumer know that you understand this is a challenge. We're here to help. We understand the bits and bytes that it takes to under- overcome those challenges. And, and let's just talk on a personal level about what it needs to, uh, to be successful in this area. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That sounds great. It's definitely a, a conference and a group that's been on my radar for a little while now, and I think I'm going to get more involved. Speaking of some of that kind of passion and application of software selling, I'm interested in this kind of chief technical evangelist role. What do you love about your, your current job? I bring a lot of personal experience into my job. Everything I do is, uh, is personal to me. My kids call me, maybe I'm a little too sensitive, but, you know, listen, I was raised to be helpful to others and I've taken that into my career, right? Being in IT is about solving problems and there's a person associated or people associated with those problems, right? Whether it's the fact that your branch office just dropped off the network because of that edge router died and you got 300 people behind that edge router in that office who are screaming. It's all about helping people solve their challenges, find success. And you know what? Network monitoring is no different. Like I said, in recent years, networking and network monitoring has become very, very challenging because of the new landscape and the evolution of networking and the pandemic. There are a lot of things that are going on today in network operations that are very challenging for those level one, level two engineers, admins, and operators, whether it's SD-WAN, whether it's you know the fact that workloads are out in the cloud and we're using more ISP network routes instead of dedicated uh, MPLS routes to get to workloads. These are challenges. And um, to be honest, I just love helping people. It's, it's in my DNA and whether it's IT or whether it's, you know, the guy downtown in Baltimore City who uh, is down on his luck, uh, whatever the case may be, it's all about helping people. And of course, this world runs on tech, so why not? help people in tech, right? At the end of the day, I may be marketing and helping to sell software, but I also know that I'm helping folks to solve challenges and to improve their business practices and continuity. And that that fulfills me a lot. One thing that I've noticed in my career is in the beginning, it was a little bit easier to measure success because I would get, I'd be given one task. I'd do that task, go back to my manager and say, I'm done that task, achievement, you know, check that box. As I've gotten to more of a senior role, it's a little bit harder to measure the success because it's not small successes. It's, well, I have to plan for the future. I have to build a whole workflow or maybe a a, a whole offering. In your role, how do you measure your success? And potentially, if you feel like you're struggling, how do you kind of get back to the reminding yourself you have achieved something? Wow, we're getting deep here, aren't we? Um, (laughs) No, this is great. You know. As we all have had uh, changes in our career and you maybe start a new job or you st- even start a completely new role, you know, you feel you're not good enough. How are you going to uh, download all this knowledge as quick as possible in order to prove yourself, right? Again, it's always been about uh, people and relationships with me. If I can help my team achieve a goal as one contributor among many, if I can provide advice to maybe a new team member on how to tackle something and remove all the noise to really get to the success they need uh, quickly, you know, like I've said before in my my previous careers, it's always about the people you surround yourself with. I find I'm very successful. I have been very successful in my career because I've aligned myself with people who are also passionate, uh, who support me, who you know, acknowledge good days and bad days and are there for me and vice versa. But if I turn that on its head and I answer the question about how would I find success in the consumers of IT and the customers that I speak to, I did a speaking engagement at the Gartner Show in Vegas in December. And I don't know, there was a couple hundred people in the room. It was great turnout. And uh, I, I told some personal stories as well as I obviously talked about network monitoring. But you know what? I had, uh, and not to boast here, but I had a nice line of folks waiting to talk to me after the session and talk about their stories. And to just say, you know what? 
I love this about what you said. I'm dealing with the same thing. Can we talk later? Get a coffee? It's that personal connection. Yes, it's about IT. Yes, it's about business continuity and revenue and all that. But, you know, finding success in IT is about, you know, how happy you are. And uh, that obviously is going to be turned into, you know, successful careers as well as uh, folks working very hard to achieve uh, the success their business is looking for. I just, I just believe that. So. I like that a lot. And I think w- with that viewpoint, I have um, an inkling, I guess, of, of how you'll respond to this next question. But I think that it's something that definitely is maybe not omnipresent, but, but always kind of at least at the edges, if not actually actively dealing with in technology is mergers and acquisitions and, and companies shifting around and, and coming together and coming apart. And with the VMware acquisition by Broadcom fairly recent anyway, I'm sure you're still dealing with the kind of at least aftershocks, if not actively figuring out how that's going to work out. What I really want to know is, you know, is that really scary, right? I mean, working in Broadcom software and then seeing that Broadcom going out and buying a software juggernaut in the enterprise space, you know, is, is, is that a scary moment or, or how do you kind of personally deal with you know, that kind of news and, and, and seeing that those things are happening around you? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I've been part of many an acquisition uh, where, you know, Broadcom bought CA Technologies back in 2018. Very, very scary. I was at the beach in the summer when we heard about it and just tried to continue to enjoy myself with my family and put it behind me because at that point it was noise. I've also been uh, part of company buyouts where I jumped ship right away because everyone else was jumping ship, right? So, you know, when Broadcom bought CA, I definitely forced myself to slow down and to stay calm and to not jump ship because I was scared, but to face this challenge and see what could come out of it that was beneficial and positive for me. I'm glad I did. Most of my team stayed, which was obviously very important to me, my work family. And I just kind of, you know, I faced that that monster with calmness and and uh, peace. You know, fingers crossed that things would work out in the end. And if and, and if they didn't, um, you guys know well enough that there's many other uh, colleagues out there that are at competing vendors that obviously would help me out. The best part about IT is that you know basically we're all selling the same thing, so we can go to other companies and pick up where we left off. Uh, when it comes to VMware, I will say this, because obviously it's still an active, uh, ongoing acquisition. When I was at Gartner, customers were coming up to me and they were saying, what do you think is going to happen? Or, you know, I'll be honest, some folks came up to me and they said, don't screw this up. Like I have anything to do with the acquisition as a marketing and evangelist person. But, you know, it's 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 scary, right? If you're the VMware administrator at a company it's your career, right? You built your career on being a LAN admin or a server admin or whatever the case may be. And that's very disruptive, right? So I do believe in what Broadcom does and the fact that we are trying to find and help uh, customers find success and obviously integrate a lot of these solutions for a, a more streamlined way to run IT operations. And I believe I believe Broadcom is uh, going to be successful and always looking to be to make their customers successful as well. So I, I have good feelings and our boss knows what he's doing. So, you know, fingers crossed, stay calm. It'll all work out. I've been at a, a I suppose, merger, but it was uh, two government companies that were merging and it went really badly. I obviously don't work there anymore, but <laughs> but uh, it was like, oh, so disjointed. And after years, they still had two completely separate systems. So it's nice to know when it does go well. <laughs> And, and the point you made there is uh, you believe in your manager and you believe in the company. And I think for me, that's a really important thing. For me personally, to be motivated to do a good job, I have to feel like I'm a part of something bigger. And I think that that, for me, is the most important part is believing in the company I work for, but also the manager I work under. I think that makes a huge difference. You know, um, I'm super into mental health now. And I recently was reading something about the fact that, you know, just trying to live in the present, right? If you're always worried about the future, once you get to that future, you're still going to be worried about the future after that and, and you know, down the line. And it's a never ending, unfortunately, very challenging way to, to think about life. So, 
you know, control what you can control and, and you know, let the rest go because it's just noise. If you were dealing with a really challenging situation or a challenging person, how would you kind of prioritize your mental health there? Or how would you maintain it in maybe a very stressful, I don't know, you've got some events coming up and you're quite stressed about it. What's your go-to tips for maintaining your mental health? It's funny because I thought I was going to be nervous for the speaking engagement at the Gartner show in Vegas. But, if, you know, I got up on stage and all that just fell away. But to answer your question, you know, when you surround yourself with folks that are there for you to support you, your team, when you feel like family, like you have a work family, that is huge because I don't feel alone in all of this. The team is there to support me, helping me fine tune the presentation and, and maybe cut it down if it's too long and promoting my vulnerability uh, during these types of speaking engagements where you can get personal with the audience and they're just not glossing over every marketing fluff word you're throwing out there. And to be honest, you know, I, I uh, try to stay healthy and athletic. So I enjoy going on a, around a noon run uh, when the weather permits, which allows me to step away from the desk and get very creative in my head. I'll come back all sweaty in my uh, in my running shoes and running shorts to uh, writing down 10 ideas I had on my run and seeing which ones work out. It's all about balance and it's all about reaching out to your team who is there to support you and, and taking time for yourself and the creativity comes and the stress falls away and it works out. It really does. I love that. And I do agree that physical and emotional health are fairly well linked. I've become a runner over the last few years myself and definitely feel a difference when, when I'm not running versus, you know, days that I do or, or weeks that I do. So, you know, diving back a little bit into your career, obviously you talked about some of these transitions in the introduction there. And really I want to kind of dive into that move from working at a end user at, at an enterprise or, you know, a place where you kind of manage the network and the IT infrastructure yourself and kind of have ownership there to moving into a vendor and, and into marketing. And I think those are kind of two different shifts maybe we should talk about differently, which is one, you know, moving into marketing, I think is something that can be terrifying uh, as well as rewarding at times. And but then also the shift from end user to vendor is, is a big one and a difference of perspective as well. So maybe you can walk us through kind of both those changes, what motivated that change and then also how you navigated it. Yeah, it's a funny story. So to be honest, uh, I was a music major in college. So talk about a transition. Yeah, I was studying music. I, I grew up uh, playing jazz saxophone all my life and uh, realized my sophomore year of college after being on my own for a very long time that I had to eat and pay rent. And <laughs> I couldn't just be the rock star that I wanted to be and had to find another way. So I was working at a, a very small hospital supply company, starting out in marketing with them. And you know how it is, these very small branch offices, you get elected to fix the computer problems for the 20, 30, 40 people that are there because you're local. And so whenever something would go wrong, corporate headquarters would call me and say, hey, can you go to this person's computer? We'll walk you through fixing it. And, and somehow it stuck. And uh, my best friend found out that I was doing this as well as um, part of my marketing roles at this company. And he had a PC technician role open at his healthcare company and told me that it was going to be $25,000 a year. And at the time, I thought that was like a million dollars because I was 24 years old and in the mid 90s. Oh, my God, that that was just an amazing salary to have. So I made the transition uh, because I felt it was a more stable job and IT was taking off. And I seemed to really enjoy and getting joy out of helping someone with their problems. Now, these were IT problems, but it still gave me that same joy of making someone happy when they were frustrated. And it went from PC tech to LAN administrator to senior LAN administrator to network engineer and uh, you know manager of network operations and then architect, et cetera. And the more you, I went through that career, the more I got so much out of it because of the fact that you could help people with their problems. I guess it's in my DNA, you know, even getting paged at 3 a.m. like we used to because the server went down and it was excruciating to be on call. It still felt good because you have no idea the ripple effects, right? 
of getting this server back up and however many mobile connections or users around the world that are now active and productive again. It's a wonderful way to be techy and geeky and helpful and paid well in today's world. Moving from the end user side into the vendor side and the marketing and evangelist side. Yeah, that was pretty scary, Chris, to be honest. Because when you're the network guy and you're the end user, you're the guy behind the curtain. You know, you're pulling all the levers. Nobody really knows what's going on. They, when something goes down, they just say the app is slow or the network's dead or, you know, and you fix it. And network guys don't ask for a lot of kudos after that. They fix it, they move on, right? Now I had to be the one that was in front of customers, presenting, writing blogs, creating presentations, videos, and standing up in front of these people and and asking them to believe me about what I was saying in my storytelling. And that that gets very personal. That is coming out from behind the curtain and asking people to like you and believe you and trust in you. And I had to work on that confidence for a few years when I started that role about 10 years ago. But again, thankfully, I had a team that was there to support me, there to uh, you know train me, there to be my fake audience if I was doing presentations or just wordsmith my blogs. And I'm very grateful for all of them to be put in this evangelist role today, which I do believe is the epitome of that trust and storytelling and passion I've always been looking to achieve. So. Yeah, and it's a it's a pinnacle of of a career as well. So so kudos for sure to have navigated that and then come out where you are. I mean, that's it's an awesome position. Like you said, you you definitely have earned it, and and it's a great spot to be in. Yeah, I think the one question I was going to ask, although I think you might have already answered it, <laughs> is tell us about a time that you felt like an imposter. You slightly answered it earlier, but maybe you can go in a little bit more depth of you felt like an imposter, and then how did you? get out of it or maybe continuous deal with that feeling of inadequacy. Yeah. Wow. I'm probably going to say something here that I've never said before, but might as well. Listen, I was a music major for two years in college, ended up changing my degree to marketing and advertising because I wanted to be creative in the, and, and was very creative, but apply a business spin to it to make some money, right? So moving into data centers, you know, the first time a branch office goes down and you got to get into that Cisco router config and you kind of know some things, you know, to play around with when it comes to iOS commands and everyone's screaming at you to get this site back up and running and you got to call Cisco because you can't figure out on your own. And then you got to call in some of your team members because they're better at being a, a you know, a, a network engineer than you were. It sucks having to ask for help. <laughs> Or have a Cisco engineer, you know, walk you through bringing this, this, you know, MPLS circuit back online. Geez, I spent hours one night when a Dell 1950 1U server went down. I think the disks died and it was like our, our file server. And all I could think was, is this office of uh, software developers I was supporting, are they going to kill me when they come in the next morning? because we hadn't had a few good backups over the previous nights. It was excruciating. So when when you know enough in IT to fix issues, but there's obviously always going to be something that happens in IT, a site goes down, a router goes down, that you just don't know what the fix is right away, man, that can make you feel very insecure about your job and the people you're trying to help. And it's hard to ask for help in IT when it comes to troubleshooting outages because you want to be the one that fixes it. it. It not only helps you improve your knowledge and your career, it helps you mentally. And, and, and just to be able to overcome that challenge uh, yourself is, is, I think, very important to many folks in IT. And I spent many a, a day asking for help because I just had to admit I didn't know what the fix was to get this site or this router back up and running. And, and that was difficult. And now I don't wait a second to ask for help. Listen, I can't do it. I'll be, I'm not going to stress about it. Somebody else knows how to fix it. Work with them and get it up and running because it's not about you. Just, you know, let's fix it and get folks productive again. It's that ego bit. Yeah, totally. You have to get over it. That's, that's <laughs> the one thing I learned with yeah. um, 
uh, jiu-jitsu. My husband is Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I pretend that I do. I'm just really rubbish. But it's the getting over the ego. You can tell when people are training and the white belts that are all, you know, jerky and really aggressive and not getting anywhere. And then there's when they get to, I don't know what belt, maybe the purple, uh, where they start to realize, okay, if they get over their ego, they're a lot more effective. It's the same. It's the same in my career. It was struggling so much being like, bloody hell, I can't solve this, but I can't ask for help. And I had to get over myself to say, okay, maybe somebody else knows more than me. And now I feel much more effective because even if I know nothing, I know somebody that knows that something. <laughs> it's so much easier just to let it go, to be honest. if I mean, just to let it go, ask for help. You get rid of so many hours spinning your wheels and, and locked into all that stress. Is it, it's not a cop out. It's just, it's so much more beneficial and easier just to let it go and, and ask for help. And then you build relationships that way, right? Which is the more valuable thing anyway, isn't it? Exactly. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, that, that's the icing on the cake. Yeah, that, that uh, brings back a lot of both painful and, uh, and sometimes joyous memories for me as well. Although I was the rare person that like liked the 3 a.m. issues because I, I liked troubleshooting. I liked, you know, antisocial hours. It's not the most personable. <laughs> I like when I could figure it out, like solving the problem. I know, amazing, that was the best part. But not being able to figure it out, to your point, is excruciating. It really, really is. Oh, it's excruciating, isn't it? And, and we take it so personally, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Um, early in my career, I had a couple very pivotal moments that changed my thinking around what we just talked about. One, I worked at a company, a financial company, and uh, early in my career as being like the PC tech where you'd have to fix all the computer problems for the end users, this was, I was assigned to the trading floor where stockbrokers are making million dollar deals, you know, every other minute and technology is what allows them to, to be successful. And when their computers are down, oh my God, they treated me like I had just run over their dog. Um, they are like, fix this now, boy. I am losing money. I'm sweating under their desk, trying to look at the cables. And oh, it, it was just miserable. I spent eight months at that job and quit because I couldn't take it mentally or physically. It was excruciating. And then I had another job where, and I'm sure we've all had this, a horrible boss, right? And uh, he was he was not a very nice person. Uh, spoke down to myself as other uh, other team members, got personal, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, he had his own issues, of course, or he wouldn't be treating other people like that. And I, I didn't say anything because I worried of the ripples, the ripple effect of saying something. But when he left, HR came to me and said, you know, we really wish you would have said something. We're here for you. And it changed my approach to, um, to not... Uh, not allow anyone to make me feel that way in my career, to be honest with people and to build those relationships and to remove that negativity from my life and from my career so I could continue on a road to success like I wanted to. Yeah, awesome. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Jeremy, thank you so much for sharing your story uh, and some great advice with the Imposter Syndrome Network. And thank you to all of our listeners for your attention and your support. We do have a LinkedIn group for the Imposter Syndrome Network that we'd love for you to join, for you to get or give career advice, mentorship, or just general community support. One thing, Jeremy, before we close out, I, I would like to know, you know, you, you've shared some great stuff here about kind of how you keep your mental health going, about teams and surrounding yourself with the right people. Out of everything you've learned in these 25 years so far, what, what's the most valuable lesson you've taken away from your career uh, up to this point? You know, it's probably going to sound cliche. And, you know, after 25 years, your kids are all grown up and, and you start thinking differently. You know, believe in yourself. One day's challenges are going to be gone the next day or in a few weeks. So don't sweat it. Everything works out. I believe it does when you, you know, when you keep that kind of positive thinking going. And, you know, just I have a mantra. I always try to do the best job I can at 100%, even 110%. So you're constantly pushing yourself to be very successful in your career, to always do a good job, to be there for others, and things just work out. Yeah, I found that to be true as well. You definitely have to put the effort in, but uh, positive thinking and the effort combination is, is a powerful one for sure. 
Are there any projects that the Imposter Network should know about that you're you're working on right now, or, or things that are interesting uh, to share? And, and yes or no, um, where can folks reach out to to chat with you? So, in my new role as a technical evangelist at Broadcom, I just was told that they're hiring a social media manager for me. So that's a whole new world. <laughs> And uh, so I just had a meeting with her and we're talking about a lot more blogging, a lot more podcasts, a lot more videos, even some fun uh, TikTok videos on just, you know, uh, subject matter like this, careers in IT. Chris, I think you'll agree. There's a whole new generation of, of IT folks entering the workplace now, you know, graduating from college. And they are thinking differently than I did when I entered in the mid 90s and early 2000s. And, uh, and marketing is completely different than it was back then. There's, you know, I was trying to get into an ad agency in New York and there's, there's no ad agencies really left much anymore. And if they are they're, they're they have a different business model. So just follow me on all the social media channels and I'll be out there, uh, trying to, uh, help as many consumers of it as I can, as well as get personal and, um, you know, uh, just be more, uh, accessible and to provide any guidance and, and advice I can in uh, being successful in IT. Fantastic. Thanks again, Jeremy. And uh, everyone else, we will be back next week. I downloaded everything just a couple of weeks ago because I was flying out to Vegas and I wanted to really immerse myself in how you do things. So. Oh, awesome. How'd you yeah. find it? Oh, I loved it. Absolutely love it. You take a very personable approach to IT. It's about the person in IT and how they're feeling and what they've accomplished and overcome. I mean, when I started in IT, I didn't think I could configure a router or a switch or... <laughs> exactly. And then here we are. So I love it. The more personable we can get, the more vulnerable we can get, I think is the better for all of us.